Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today, sex offenders. Who are they? Why are they committing these crimes? Are they curable, or should they just be put away indefinitely? And uh, filling us in on this subject is uh, Dr. Anna Salter, who received her Ph.D. in clinical psychology and public practice from Harvard, and she wrote the first book that lays out how do you treat child and sex offenders and how do the victims cope with this. She's also written seven other books, interestingly including uh, five uh, novels that revolve around uh, crime. And she now is a consultant to the Department of Corrections uh, in Wisconsin, as well as a national, internationally well-known speaker on this subject. Anna, thank you very much for being with us again. I appreciate your being here. Thank you for having me. In the United States, can you give us some idea of how large the numbers are of sex offenders, how frequent this happens, how many people might fall under this umbrella? It's difficult to know how many sex offenders there are because many don't get caught, but what we do know is somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of girls in this country are molested and 9 to 16 percent of boys. So mm. we know that it is a massive problem. Now, many sex offenders commit a few offenses, and some commit an astronomical number of offenses. Abel has estimated that 5% of the sex offenders commit 70% of the crimes. My goodness. Why is that? Because they're high-risk offenders. They're serial pedophiles or serial rapists and so forth. How do they get away with it? How can they do so many? I spoke to a man who got away with, he estimated, 1,250. He was uh, very personable. He was uh, middle class. He worked as an athletic director in a middle school, and he molested kids for 20 years. Now, over the course of those years, several times kids told their parents, and in each case, until the last one, their parents said, there must be some mistake here. John is a good man. John loves you. John wouldn't do anything like that. There must be some mistake. So they thought their kid was lying? They thought their kid was lying or confused. I don't really know what excuses parents make for not taking it seriously. But when I go into prisons and interview offenders, they all, this kind of offender, the, the white middle class professional offender, they all told me of incidents where they had gotten away with it. And many get grandiose after a while because even when they're caught, nothing happens. So they start thinking that uh, they can get away with anything. Across studies, somewhere between 10 to 18 percent of child molestations ever go to authorities. Hmm. You know, there's a sub-message here I'm hearing, and that's what would you say to parents when a child reports to them some sexual abuse? Something I keep saying over and over is you have to separate out likability and trustworthiness. You cannot assume it's a bogus report just because that is a likable man who is responsible in, in, in every other way. He may not be a psychopath. He may not be irresponsible everywhere. But he could easily be a sex offender. I would take reports seriously, report them to authorities, and have the child evaluated. Well, it, it would seem from what you're saying that a very small percentage of reports to parents get acted on. Well, they don't necessarily go to parents. When I say oh. 10 to 18 percent, what I mean is that either the child didn't tell anybody oh, okay. or the child told a friend who kept it a secret or in some cases the child did tell the parent and the parent just found it, was incredulous, found it impossible to believe. Do you have any idea what percentage of incarcerated prisoners are there for a sex offense? Well, I haven't checked that recently, but it ranged last, the last time I checked uh, from like 10 to 20 percent of a offenders. Few. Quite a few. Yeah, they are now a substantial portion of the prison population. And. What are the various categories of sex offenders? Well, we'll start with child sex offenders. There are men who are pedophiles, and pedophiles are people with a deviant arousal pattern, meaning 
they look at Angela Jolie, and mm -hmm. she is walking with a three-year-old, and their eyes slide immediately to the three-year-old, and they think, oh, isn't he cute? Mm -hmm. His skin is so smooth, and they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're off aroused. to the races. They're aroused by children. Now, they can be aroused by adults as well. There are, in fact, many incest offenders show this pattern where they are aroused by adults, but they are sexually attracted to children. These are the guys that give us the most trouble because they can be responsible in every other area of their lives. They can be charming, they can be personable, uh, and they just get away with it for a very long time. The second category is antisocial offenders, including psychopaths. And these are people who often commit a lot of other crimes and they will violate anybody's rights. So. Mm. The girlfriend is at home, her 11-year-old daughter is, she'll do. They have a, you know, straight antisocial thinking. They're out for number one. They don't always have a deviant arousal pattern. They may be uh, molesting for because of availability. They'll sort of use anybody. In fact, of the men who actually uh, assault children and rape adults, at least one study found that two-thirds of them were not only antisocial, they were actually psychopaths. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, men, I'm talking about male offenders now yes. because the female typology is different. We, uh, then we have men who are identified with children. They don't really want to be an adult. They think of, they wish they were more childlike. They are threatened by adults. They see children as loving, as open-hearted, as accepting, as non-judgmental. So those are the three biggest categories. And they have sex with children or try to? Oh, they do. But they're not pedophiles? Oh, yeah, they're sometimes pedophiles. And they're sometimes their primary motivation is because they want to be a child themselves. But they do have sex with, with children. Are, are, is everyone who has sex with children, every adult, a pedophile? No, so many of the antisocial offenders are not. That's why we separate out child molester and pedophile. Pedophile means sexual attraction to kids. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean, child molester means it doesn't matter why you molest them, you molest them. Okay. For example, many incest offenders are not pedophiles, although some are, but many of them are entitled. Uh, one said mm -hmm. to me, my home is my castle and I'll do what I goddamn well please. Mm. Uh, that, that kind of statement, that children are property, they own the children, it can be revenge against a spouse, can be uh, revenge against a child. So there are different motivations for molesting children. Why is a pedophile a pedophile? He doesn't know, and honestly, we don't know. The easy answer is because they were molested as children. But it turns out that if you, uh, Jan Hyman did three studies five years apart, and in each one she said to one group of offenders, were you molested as a child? She said to a second group, were you molested as a child? You'll have to take a polygraph on your answers. In three different studies, the ones who were not threatened with a polygraph, about two-thirds of them, 65 to 67 percent, said they were molested as children. When they were threatened with a polygraph, it dropped to 29 to 31 percent. Mm -hmm. So we lost half of them. Yeah. So it may be that as many as 70 percent were not molested as children. Where does it come from? We don't know. Is it possibly a sexual preference, like heterosexuality mm -hmm. and homosexuality? Yes, it possibly is. So it could be genetic? It could be, although I haven't seen any studies that demonstrate that. And I take it the crimes of... You didn't mention rape as a category. I assume you're putting that under antisocial. No, that the categories I was talking about were all about children. For rapists, oh, okay. the best typology that we have came from Prinke and Knight, and that includes opportunistic rapists, uh, uh, the kind of rapist who uh, comes in the house to steal the TV, a woman is there alone, great, that's a bonus. Hmm. He doesn't fantasize about raping women, but mm -hmm. if he has the opportunity, he will. Then there are uh, vindictive rapists who just don't like women. Uh, the, the bitch got what she deserved for being out on the street at 7 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Then there are pervasively angry rapists who don't appear to like anybody. They get in fights in bars, they get in fights with their supervisors, uh, they get fired from jobs, and they rape women. 
And none of these are primarily sexual motivations. But then we have the group that has a specifically sexual motivation, and those are the ones who, have, uh, who dream about rape. They may be having sex with someone, but it would be so much nicer if she didn't want to and they had to force her. Mm -hmm. And the sadist. And those are aroused by pain, suffering, terror, and humiliation. And I forgot to mention that, that when I was talking about children. But in fact, 5% of sex offenders are sadists, and there are sadists who assault children. I see. And among these different rapists, is there a, a, a different pattern where one does commit many more serial rapes than the others, or? Well, the, the coercive, the paraphilic rapist, the rapist who is really just attract, it was really attracted by force and the no. idea of force. He can be a high, certainly he can be a high frequency rapist. Uh, unfortunately, so can sadists once they, once they get started. I should mention most of this work is done on incarcerated offenders and they are often stranger rapists. The group that I don't think we have enough research on are the acquaintance rapists, the, co the close to 10% of college students um, who serially rape, date rape, 8.9% in one study, for wow. example. And do they usually get away with it? Oh, yes, they usually do get Why? away with it. It's a he said, she said phenomenon. And uh -huh. It, it, there's certainly a lot of controversy now about how colleges handle rape accusations. And Wouldn't that imply that most rapists get away with it? Because it's not always or often he said, she said? Well, they may, but if you break in someone's house, mm, sure. there's more evidence, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, if you're a um, verbal, articulate college student and he said we were out on a date and she agreed mm -hmm. it is more difficult do you think those men are similar in characteristics to what you were just describing and we were talking about rapists those men on in studies appear to be halfway between antisocial rapists and we're often stranger rapists but not always and regular college students on scales of antisociality they're somewhere between the mm -hmm. two and do you think the culture they're in may facilitate that, like drunken parties and things like that? Absolutely, and fraternities. Mm -hmm. Many uh, group behavior will facilitate it, developing norms that imply that it's okay. Rape has more of a correlation with the culture than does child molestation. Uh -huh. Both have been with us for thousands of years, but child molestation appears, it, it does not seem to vary as much by the culture as rape does. And, and what is the, um, sounds awful, but the perfect breeding ground culturally for date rape? Well, the perfect uh, breeding ground is a group that endorses it and that has uh, opportunity. Honestly, uh, traditionally fraternities, some fraternities have been the perfect breeding ground. They have even had you know, Tuesday night of the movies where uh, they sit down and watch the movies of members of the fraternity having sex with women or who are too drunk to say no and who have no idea they're being filmed. Wow. Well, let's make a U-turn and go back to, um, I assume we've covered all the categories. Uh, Pretty and, much. And let's go back to the pedophiles. Okay. Um, are they curable? We don't actually use the word cure. Okay. If you have uh, any more than they use it with alcoholics, but the the research does suggest, based on a meta analysis of 42 studies, that you can get as much as a 40 percent decrease in offending with good treatment. That's not very hopeful. If you can cut it almost in half, I would tell you that's very hopeful. It, well, it, it, but you're saying a lot of these people are serial pe uh, offenders. Yes. And if they do it with 15 kids and then they get caught and go to prison. The math could be they'll go out and just do it with six kids next time. 40%. I think what, no, it's the 40% is any offense. Oh, okay. Any offense, not. Yes. Have are they done so less than they So 40% will even probably not recommit. As far as we can act. tell. Now, these are short term studies, like four years was the medium in this research, and whether this lasts 
12 or 20 years is another story. I don't think we know how long the impact of treatment is. I which, which ones are more prone to being successful in treatment? Is there a way of delineating who might take well to treatment and who won't? Well, the one group we know doesn't take well to treatment are psychopaths, the, the offenders who don't have a conscience. Um, conscience. Now, in child molestation, less than 10% are psychopaths. Incest is about 10%, and in one study, out-of-home out molestation was about 6%. Right? And the ones who did both, incest and out-of-home, it was about 6%. So they're not mostly psychopaths, but you do get up to 10% who are psychopaths, and treatment may, in fact, make them worse. So in that case, the best public policy if they're child offenders and psychopaths, is to not release them? The best public policy, if they're psychopaths, in my opinion, is to give them whatever sentence the law allows, but to not make the mistake of thinking that treatment will make them better, to not release them on the basis of treatment gains. Just a little aside, but you know, we have such wide labeling of sex offenders now when they come out of prison. Is that overdone? Well, I think it's overdone. But one thing, no one pays attention to it because now it's so routine. But secondly, it assumes a fact that isn't true. It assumes that offenders work on the basis of location. Offenders don't work on the basis of geography. There's a little thing called cars. Offenders go uh, work on the basis of their church or mentoring kids or joining uh, trying to join the Boy Scouts or other national organizations. They work on the basis of, of their vocation and their avocation. They don't work on the basis of their block. Right. So, and so these are notices sent out to people nearby with this these sex offender settling. Yeah, even though many of those guys never molested anybody or that was close to them geographically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so this person is released. And if you look at this policy of, of sending letters or notices to people nearby and you're permanently a sex offender and you are restricted from lots of different jobs because you're a sex offender, um, is that a smart public policy to put all these restrictions on everyone who's labeled a sex offender, besides the geography issue? Uh, some of them, we don't have research on everything, but we have research on some things. For example, residency restrictions. Residency restrictions simply don't work. That, that you can't live within 2,000 feet of a school or something like that. They just don't work because, one, people have cars. Yeah. And, two, they've done studies about whether the residency restriction inhibited new offenses, and they didn't. I'm also wondering about some injustice here, that there's different types of sex offenders, and a person who may have done one thing once in their life that was a stupid thing to do when they're high or something is then labeled a sex offender for life. That's, I agree with you. For example, if you are 18 years old and your 15-year-old girlfriend gets pregnant, mm -hmm. you're going to end up on the sex offender registry, likely in many, many places. But what sense does that make? There was, uh, within a three-year difference, I call those guys status offenders. Within a three-year difference, there was no force. Sex was in the context of a social relationship, and there's no evidence of manipulation. Well, that's different when a 25-year-old and a 12-year-old. Yes. They're by no means in the same age category, but a 15 and an 18-year-old can be. That guy may be treated the same as a sadist who, come, who comes out of prison, and that, that dilutes any usefulness that the registry would have, and it also pretty much ruins his life. Wow. Any, now, this is a very hard question, but any percentage, at least in the state you consult in, in Wisconsin, as a prototype, uh, of people labeled sex offenders that have been released shouldn't have had that stigma placed on them that it's going to make their life harder, make it more likely they can't get a job, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have figures on that, and I wouldn't speculate, but there are an awful lot of stories about that. For example, um, I have a colleague whose son is schizophrenic, and he did uh, something inappropriate at one point. He touched someone or something. Mm -hmm. He's now labeled a sex offender, which makes it virtually impossible for her to get any treatment for him, even though any residential placement 
even though he had no offenses before that and no offenses after that, and it it seemed a product of the mental illness. But it definitely that has uh, made it very difficult to find even a place for him to live. Let's talk about treatment. How do you, you say, Pedophiles can be treated 40% of the time successfully if they're not psychopaths. In the short term. Okay, even in the short term. You mean in five, they might be good for two years, but in five years they might recommit? No, I mean that the studies oh. are, are only out to about four years on okay. average, so we oh, don't know what happens 20 you. years Sorry. later. Okay. What is successful treatment? How do you treat a pedophile? There are two major camps today, and one is called relapse prevention, and that was based on alcohol and drug treatment. And that involves looking for the cycle of offending, what uh, thoughts and feelings preceded the offending, how he got himself in a high-risk situation, meaning a situation where he could molest children, how he groomed the child, how he made contact, how he groomed the child, and he learns how to recognize each of these stages and exit early, exit mu very early before he gets anywhere near a child. So he's got to be motivated not to do this again. Yes, he does have to be motivated not to do this again. Uh, but there are motivated people who do it again. So t treatment does have an impact for, on, because it gives those people skills to avoid mm. it. The second major treatment today is the Good Lives Model, and that teaches people to meet their social and sexual needs in other ways. So many of these offenders are isolated. They have no support system. Uh, and, and that that really helps them build a life that is incompatible with offending. I, there's not a lot of research in the Good Lives model yet, and personally, I don't think it's sufficient by itself, but I think it's useful in combination with other things. Now, they are, there's also behavioral, for those offenders who have a deviant arousal pattern, mm -hmm. part of treatment would either be behavioral reconditioning or medication. The antidepressants often have as a side effect a decrease in sexual interest. And in the case of someone who is purely a pedophile, that's a very good thing. Uh, across the board, so even heterosexual would... Yes, it will work better on people who don't have adult interest because you will dampen both the adult interest and the pedophilic interest. But if you find yourself in jail three times for pedophilia, it... <laughs> You know, obviously, it's something that you have to deal with. You used to use electric shock years ago, where you'd watch uh, pictures of kids and then you get shocked. Yeah, didn't generalize. Because in the real world, there is no electric shock. Mm. So it really didn't generalize very well. And treatment for the rapist, the violent sexual criminal? You can still use a relapse prevention in the good lives model, but I think... I think the record is more mixed about how successful that is. I'm not sure we know how successful treatment for rapists is. And I, for a sadist, I personally don't think that, well, mostly they don't get out of prison, but I certainly wouldn't recommend release on the basis of treatment. I assume most sadists are sociopaths or psychopaths? Uh, the serial killers are. Mm -hmm. They typically are psychopathic and sadistic. They because people who have sadistic interest, who who are not psychopathic, will join an S and M club, mm. and mm -hmm. so they'll do something that is actually consenting because they have a conscience, but they have the sexual interest in spanking or whatever. Right? The the ones who who don't do that, who break the law, are typically people who have at least a lot of antisocial traits mm -hmm. if they're not fully psychopathic and they have more extreme needs. They want to torture someone mm. in order to get sexually aroused. You call it needs? That's what they call it. But whatever it is, it, I've had offenders say, I, I always knew how to get high. Just by controlling someone, I would get high. But the high from, from sadism was greater and it would last days. I assume this is a very tiny number of people. 5% of sex offenders. They don't all kill. Sometimes they just torture people. That's not a tiny number, is it? I wouldn't say that's actually tiny, but it is probably the smallest group of sex offenders that we have. Are there some recent cases of famous cases that fit that profile? Like, is Ted Bundy fit that profile? He certainly sounds like he fits that profile, mm -hmm. okay. although he appears 
Bundy appears to have gotten his highs mainly from killing, mm. uh, more more than torture, for example. Okay. And that's a different thing than sadism. It's it's certainly a relative. Okay. And the trends in sexual crimes and, and sexual criminals, if you if you look from when you were in college to now, has there been a change in crime is going down, at, at least in the U.S., mm -hmm. which is where I know the figures better. But yeah. crime has been dropping for twenty years, including in, sexual, crime. including sexual crime. And are they dropping equally, or is one type of sexual crime dropping faster than another? I haven't seen figures that would tease that out. Okay. And what do you attribute this to? Why? I think it's very interesting. I don't think um, I hear different explanations. It's the baby boomers generation getting older. It's this and that. I'm not sure we know why crime is dropping. But what we know is that crime actually is dropping. Well, that's a good thing. Yes. So if you were the czar of all uh, corrections in the United States, what would you change about how we deal with sex offenses? Well, I'd like to, what I would say is that we don't have enough treatment and putting these guys back on the streets with no treatment is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. and hardly any state, no state that I have ever talked to has enough treatment for the number of sex offenders they have. Why they not? Will, Why not? Uh, money yeah. and because typically people don't think treatment works. Treatment mm -hmm. actually does have an impact. Uh, on sex offending for most groups of okay. sex offenders. So right now it's kind of, it sounds kind of dumb. We put people away for a while, warehouse them, let them out, and they repeat. That can then happen. Then we put them back. Now some people say, well, we, the public has it all wrong. The relapse rate isn't high. It's 13%. That, that really annoys me because they don't tell the rest of the story. It, they get 13% get caught in the mm. first four to five years. Mm -hmm. If you go out 20 years, it's considerably higher. In one study, half the out-of-home offenders would eventually get caught for mm -hmm. a crime, and 39% of the rapists would eventually get caught for a crime. So that 13% is kind of a made-up bogus And figure. that's who gets caught, not just... That's who gets caught. So the number who actually repeat must be... It is much higher. That's More honestly, but the thing yeah. that concerns me the most is people seem to think they're all in prison. Hmm. You know, they they aren't. There are lots of sex offenders operating successfully. And what I tell parents is, you have to face the fact that you will not recognize a sex offender. Um, I had a neighbor say to me, "I don't worry about this, Anna. I can spot them." And I said, "Well, that's interesting because I can't." And she said, oh, yes, you can. You've been in this field 20 years. Sure you can. And I said, what my 20 years buys me is I know I can't, and you think you can. So, well, what is the prototype people have in their mind of how they'll know a sex offender when they see it? Oh, I just had an email yesterday. They look in their eyes and talk to them, and they don't uh -huh. think they're a se sex offender. But something's creepy about them or something. Something's creepy about them. Yeah. If you look at these videos, something is not creepy about many of these guys. And the message I'd like to get across to the community is work on deflection, not detection. You are not going to detect them, so you have to decrease the opportunities for them to offend. How do you do that? For example, the Boy Scouts I went to Too Deep Leadership uh, many years ago. Uh, nobody's alone with a child in mm. the scouting. Music lessons, your house, not the person's house. The coach wants to take a trip with the kids. Go along. No, hang on. That, that's a lot of hassle in changing your lifestyle, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's important and necessary. People think strangers are the problem. Strangers are the least likely person mm -hmm. to molest your child. I think I'm as busy as most people. I learned to score baseball, so I'd have an excuse to hang around the team. I ended up coaching uh, a little league team along with two other people. As an aside, I'll tell you that at one point we discovered we all had PhDs. We looked at each other mm. and said, good Lord, it's a wonder these children have won a <laughs> single game. But get involved. We cannot trust. You just can't send your child off to these group organizations and activities and trust that there won't be someday a pedophile in one of them. And what I'm also hearing from you is if you get any reports from your children about anything unusual, take it seriously. Take it seriously. Don't blow off a child. 
they do not typically come up with graphic reports of sexual abuse by their choir director. Take it seriously. Go to the authorities. Let them check it out. Get your child evaluated. And Anna, you have a CD or a, uh, some some production on this that you thought would be helpful to people if they want. To well, I out. have that. I have a DVD, Truth, Lies, and Sex Offenders, on my website, and it has very charming people who operated in churches and schools for many years without getting caught, and they tell you how they fool people. I also have uh, some of those transcripts in my book called Predators, and a section for parents on deflection, not detection. And they would find that at AnnaSalter.com. AnnaSalter.com. Anna Salter, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.